Um, this is the third Thursday talk with artist Brandon Latou in conversation with curator Charlotte Cotton. This is the first Thursday, third Thursday talk we've had since May, so it's nice to start the fall season. Um, before we do, I thought we would do our normal land acknowledgement. And uh, so I will, it's up, should be up on the screen and I'll also read it. We at UCR Arts would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air. The Cahuilla, Gabriel, Gabrielino Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples and all of their ancestors and descendants past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. So today, we'll be having a conversation between uh, Brandon Latou and curator Charlotte Cotton. This is on the occasion of his survey exhibition, which opened last Saturday at UCR Arts California Museum of Photography. The title of it is Empirical Textual Contextual, and it flows through the main floor gallery in the California Museum of Photography and occupies the second floor as well. Um, Brandon will be in conversation with curator Charlotte Cotton, and then we'll come back and have live questions and answers. You can throw questions into the chat anytime you want, and we'll get to them at the end of the conversation. So with that, we will start the conversation between Charlotte Cotton and artist Brandon Latou. In this Got it. Brandon Latou, who would have thought we would be sitting here reflecting on your incredible survey exhibition at California Museum of Photography? We made it. Yeah, not sitting together necessarily, but I guess that's part of the pandemic. It's, uh, it's nice to have gotten here, Charlotte. Congratulations. It's an incredible exhibition looking at 20, over 25 years of your practice. And I think I wanted to start by asking you about where you are on the journey of reflecting because it's all pretty fresh. I mean, you're literally sort of like wiping, wiping the dust off your shoes from installation at this stage. But how are you feeling? Yeah, I, I guess it's uh, three or four days uh, since we since we finalized it, and um, the actual reception is coming up in just a couple of days. And um, I'm I'm glad to be here, kind of recording uh, some of these reflections on the exhibition, which definitely is quite new for me. I mean, I think I can say from the outset that uh, one thing that really strikes me is I've never seen a lot of these works together. I've never seen yeah. a lot of them together. Um, I work in a uh, very varied fashion, a, a, a heterogeneous fashion. I don't make the same kind of works uh, time and time again. Uh, one exhibition in a gallery will look very different than the next exhibition. So the result here is that we actually have a whole bunch of different kinds of works about different kinds of issues and different kinds of experiences. And how, I mean, that's, I mean, how do you feel about that? I mean, is it, does it just feel like a very strange and unique experience or are you able to sort of take a step back from that and, and take account of what that means in terms of how you might describe your practice? It, it, it's interesting. Um, this is the yeah it's the largest show i've ever done and um am i able to like you said it's sort of like uh it's part way there like it's maybe not fully digested yet um but this viewing in the same kind of visual space of things that i made say 10 or even 20 years apart at different times has definitely made me look at some of these objects, these images in a different kind of a way. I'm really pleased at the, the way that you built context for them. I mean, Charlotte, you, you specified the 
actual architecture within uh, uh, an exciting but but somewhat limited kind of space as well. And it really opened up the possibility for these sorts of comparisons. Um, as you know, a lot of my work does deal with architecture explicitly. That's one of my primary um, subtexts or I guess themes in a way. It's something I return to. And um, I think that there's a kind of clarity brought to the work by your your revisioning and your uh, your changing of the space, literally. Well, I think we should, I mean, I should say, of course, that's a thousand times easier for an outsider to telescope out and see uh, an over 25 year practice um, as a whole and as something that can be brought together as a whole. So I think I had the easier and probably more pleasurable side of the bargain <laughs> on our journey. But maybe we should have a look at some of the installation shots, which um, admittedly are iPhone shots. So they're not kind of final, beautiful, um, professional installation shots, but actually to give, give the listener a sense of what we're talking about, about the relationships that begin to be struck struck up between work of different periods of your practice. Okay, that sounds great. Um, I, I got some images, as you say, probably iPhone rough images from the gallery. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, jump into that. So give me a second here. I think it's this way. Oh. Um, so yeah, these are a very kind of loose uh, set of images of the exhibition. Some of them are individual uh, works, and then a number of them are like this, a kind of view of what one would see in person in the show. And um, this is actually the entrance to the CMP. Right after you come in the door, we begin with a sculpture on the right, this white column. And then uh, one can see the the wall in the distance that shows uh, uh, the title of the exhibition. And um, I think I can jump ahead to that, actually. So here. Charlotte, should I say something about the title that we, we worked out after? <laughs> <laughs> made you wait for months and months and we we went back and forth about that i th i think it would be a great idea i mean i don't think we have to take people through the full journey of years of the title shifts but um i, I just want to say i'm really happy with this subtitle of empirical textual and contextual which is both feels incredibly detailed and succinct and very you. On the other hand, it has that sort of openness to interpretation that I think your work also also has. Uh -huh. um, I appreciate that. I, I don't know, to sometimes titles are things that I really enjoy. There's another work that is titled Full to Bursting in the show that maybe we'll get a chance to look at that was actually the title to my last show. And uh, sometimes they come quite fluidly and sometimes they don't. And this would actually have to be one of the more challenging uh, shows to title. But I, I did feel like it needed that. And um, I appreciate the dialogue that we had. I, I mean, I think that um, m m I mean, I'm, I'm a professor as well. And my students would recognize that I, I do emphasize the empirical, which is, you know, things that come from the five senses. And so I think that's a really critical aspect to art, right? To think about what comes individually to each of us through our senses um, and how actually that's different for uh, different people, right? Uh, different people have different levels of vision, different senses, different mobilities and uh, a different backgrounds that might change how their empirical reception of the works or, or the world might be. That's um, so interesting. I hadn't, you know, I hadn't thought of it. I mean, I hadn't thought of it specifically like that. I guess I had also been thinking of empirical as a word, word that we casually kind of throw at photography as like one of the kind of core tenets of your exhibition in California Museum of Photography. And um, it's, it strikes me as very, very you that immediately you open up 
to question this idea of the assumptions that you might make with even the word empirical. Uh huh. Yeah, I um, I certainly do. Or or it's a let's say it's a constant that I come around to because, like you say, oh. photography or for that matter, sculpture. Um, I think most of the modes of production of art that I engage with does prioritize kind of like what one gets perhaps visually first uh, uh, from the work. But then, like you say, it has this association to the representational quality of photography. Mm -hmm. And um, I also would say, too, this is an exhibit that is within the institution of a university. And we think of empirical proof and things as, as having to do with those kinds of associations to science or other things. But then in art, something that one sees is very unruly, right? There's the kind of cliche or truism that the, the meaning is, is determined by the viewer and things. And yet I think that that unruliness or the kind of fluidity of something that is empirical is often fixed by words or language or the textual. And um, I'm really interested in this kind of wrestle, right? Like, like for example, yeah. in the exhibition, you were really um, uh, proactive about wanting to have text be quite visible. And um, it's something we talked back and forth about. And ultimately, I came down on your side that it is really useful for people to see um, some of the, the text that underpins or uh, is, is behind the motivation for some of the works. And so... I see that kind of coming up again and again throughout the show. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, textual, the next word of the the, the title. Um, again, I think it's, it's very you that it means it's very layered meaning of that, because on the one hand, textual can mean that there are there are works in the exhibition, whether they're kind of 3D printed renderings, sculptures, reliefs, or, or kind of, you know, straight photographs, which essentially do rely on language, on the text as, as the form, right? You know, they're, they're, they're just inextricably linked. The form and the textual are together as one. And, but at the same time, I think that my experience of spending a lot of time with you and understanding how these very, very resolved works of art actually are, are through these investigations and inquiries, these ongoing inquiries, and actually have these, what you might call the stories behind the works, that these kind of annotations or these footnotes, these textual footnotes, to these very resolved works felt really important to at least propose as part of the relationship that a viewer would have in this exhibition with your work. And as you say, you know, it's the first time you've seen <laughs> all of this work together. So it's like we're all in the kind of in the same boat of how do you bring works that have never been seen together together so that there's a there's a narrative that you can find and you can resolve and the text becomes i think a really important um annotation or footnote to the experience the empirical experience of the work mm -hmm. um i'm mean, going to go to the next image because i think it kind of relates to what you're saying yeah. well um so this is a work from 2016 and and i sort of pop pop ahead because I was thinking about the way you were talking about text in the work and then also the uh, the anecdotes that surround the work. And in this case, this is a, a photograph that is a, a, an image of a, a, a girl standing in front of another photograph. And the photograph that she's standing in front of is a, a very detailed picture of an ATM machine that was on my wall. And uh, one day in the studio, my daughter, who was, I think, uh, 12 or 13 at the time, walked in front of this uh, life-size one-to-one -one picture of an ATM machine. And it, it really activated this empirical uh, effect of this sort of Trump loy, where it seems yeah. as though the girl is literally in front of an ATM. But 
If you look closely, even in this image, you can see pins up on the right and left hand corner. And then when you're viewing this in person, you can see push pin holes on the wall. You can see a seam right up and down the middle of the image. And uh, the girl herself is really rendered in a, a, a much more detailed kind of fashion. But to come back to the text, in fact, you see here an advertisement for uh, for depositing one's money um, without even using the ATM. And if you look closely at the image, too, you also see that there's a cell phone in her back pocket. And I became really interested in this kind of like uh, almost obsolescence of the ATM while it's being used or certainly as someone becomes older as this this young woman becomes an adult um yeah. it's likely that this device itself will be kind of erased from her usage and i think a lot of that comes visually empirically but it's certainly a lot of it is also necessary to kind of look at the language here and then think about some of the other language that accompanies the work and i think but that also ref for me refers to the idea of contextual the final word in the title in terms of, you know, one of the challenges, well, I don't know if it's a challenge, but I think it's a challenge sounds negative and I don't mean it to. I mean, one of the kind of opportunities of surveying 25 years of practice is that these works were made in different contexts. But what I found in your work and um, which was incredibly gratifying, which is because because of the way that you work, which is really measured and slow, and um, there's a direct relationship between the physical object and the context in which it's made, and the issues that you are working through, the questions that you are asking yourself, that those contexts sort of remain very vivid in the experience of the work, regardless of where on the journey of the 25 years that they appear. So there's something, for, for example, within this piece, which on the one hand is like, I imagine the sort of movable response to this piece is both generational in terms of who is looking at this. Like, you know, for me, obviously, it's still so naturalized to me. The ATM is so naturalized that it still exists for me, where I do think that with a younger viewer, it's immediately an anach anachronistic sort of not quite sure how it actually works kind of object from the past. It's historical, it's obsolete. It's obsolete. But on the other hand, it's like, um, it's probably more likely that on first glance or part cursory glance, I won't see the trompe l'oeil. What I will see oh. is a young girl standing at an ATM. And it's not really until I spend, you know, I stop and pay attention that the trompe l'oeil, the fact that the print of the ATM is pinned to the wall and that this is... Um, an affect and it's a mirage, <laughs> a kind of contextual historical mirage really becomes evident. And that's not to say that the experience isn't as powerful for me, um, you know, empirically, sensorily uh, powerful for me as it would be for somebody who's younger, who would just, it's just the kind of order in which you read the layers and you, the order in which you kind of encounter the context in which you've made the piece. I can, I mean, I think that's really eloquent and uh, I appreciate your saying that about the work. And I do think that the age of someone alters their empirical reception of things. Exactly. And, um, I think you really put your finger on that. I'm going to jump ahead to another work that, that, that deals with context in this way. But I, I also want to say that I'm really interested in, like, if we think of sculpture here, I'm going to go ahead. Yeah. And just jump to this. Oh, and, yummy. And that, what? I was just like, I, I always, I immediately feel something like just physical. My, my empirical response to your potato is, <laughs> is always kind of quite bodily, like yummy. I can almost smell it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate that. I think it, I think it's a really like a sensorial kind of work. It's both icky and attractive, maybe. Um, yeah. And it's also 
a little too large, right? It, it definitely is. It's <laughs> vastly too large, but when you look at it, it becomes absurd. And um, I, I should say that when I first started this work, I, I was, uh, gosh, I think it was maybe 2017 or so, and I was making potato soup and I was cutting up these potatoes and I, I really looked down at one of the potatoes and I was, I was struck by how beautiful it was and how strangely um, like non-human, but very much like a body the, the little potato was. It has skin and eyes and blemishes and they're each unique, right? right. And uh, that, that really struck me with its kind of physical insistence. Um, but to come back to what you were talking about, about context with, within the show, with the girl, with the ATM, I think that's really played up in, in this work and another related work uh, in that um, these, these are sculptures that to me extend beyond the wall that you're seeing here and into the other space of the, uh, of the larger institution. And so, um, this is uh, a view and you, you can see there's a little bit of reflection in the right hand side, but how the potato extends into the, the gallery that is beyond this wall. And um, I made this, you know, photograph by rendering the original potato that I scanned and and showing how at scale it would extend into that space and you know for me it does in a way that's actually no different than the illusion of a photograph any photograph that one has seen kind of captures a moment in time and then and then continues to make that available mentally for a viewer kind of forever yes. so just to sort of shift back this is that kind of small photograph on the right this is what you see yeah so um just to just to sort of reinforce what you're saying and the experience of this work i mean significantly the potato sculpture is is one of the works where we decided it was unnecessary to have an extended uh object label and ex and that you know the behind the scenes narrative um, because the work is so bodily and empirical, but basically the experience is, is, is that you've got this enormous potato protruding from out of the wall, like that is the empirical experience of this sculpture. And the photograph sort of stands in as this documentation of what you would see if you were standing the other side of the wall, which is the kind of the rest of this monumentally sized potato and um it's um I, it, for me it was really important i mean from very early on i mean we've been working on this show you know given all of the delays for literally years but from i think really from the very earliest plans that we made the potato would be in the you know literally the first space that you walk into and then Archimedean solid, which is the related sculpture, would sort of be seen from the entrance, but would sort of like sort of alert you to, to kind of moving through the space. So it wasn't a sort of direct binary comparison, but they're sort of visually connected as soon as you walk in to the exhibition space. And for me, that was important kind of as a way of immediately opening up for the viewer that firstly, the way that we would, were presenting a survey show was not in the absolutely flat-footed, deadpan sort of like, well, Brandon Latou started here and then he went here and then he went here and then like a progress journey, sort of a chronological journey. Not least because, you know, as you were saying at the very beginnings of this conversation, you know, your work doesn't work like that. It isn't like it, 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 a sort of constant that shifts a little. It's like you move, like the eventual forms that your works or bodies of work take move you all over the place. So time becomes a sort of, and chronology becomes pretty immaterial. It's like these kind of leaps and these reconnections that happen. But I also, I also wanted in that first space, as you come into the space, for there to be this kind of real invitation to sort of say, look, all bets are off. Like 
every emotion and every sensory experience that you have within this exhibition is valid. I mean, we just stuck, you know, we've, you've got the monumental potato protruding from the wall. I mean, like, how are you going to make intellectual art historical sense of that immediately? You're not, that you're going to respond to that really with, with your eyes and with your body in terms of what's the sense of this piece. Yeah, it's, it's uh, definitely a visceral thing, I think. And it has a kind of uncanny quality to it. I like uh, someone mentioned it at the point that like uh, it's, it's halfway between the moon and a turd. And I always kind of liked that, that it, it literally kind of looks that way. That the, the two were squeezed together. Oh, and, and, and in this case, I have to say that when I first showed this to Lynn Marsh, who has the exhibit, uh, next door, and that's actually the wallpaper from from her project. Yeah. Uh, we we looked at it and we were like, oh God, it's almost obscene, right? Like it's like some pig snout or some butt sticking through the wall or something. And uh, yeah, I I appreciate that kind of um, yeah visceral quality to it. And and like you say, there's there's many places throughout the work where maybe a subject like the potato will come back but it doesn't i'm not using it in the same way so i'll use it against the kind of sense that it, it's established in one piece or another uh maybe we'll maybe we'll jump past this or do you, okay. you want to okay. yeah no other than i still really love it and i and i've i feel that i'm still feeling really smug about that decision to sort of hang the kind of truffle tumor at the top over the top of the wall. It's like, that's so good. Yeah, I think that was the, the right decision there. <laughs> I think I'm going the right way now. Yeah. And um, maybe there's something that we want to say about this corner or. Um... Well, yeah, because I think I'm, this is again in the sort of first zone of the exhibition and um, one of the other elements, I mean, I think there's sort of two elements here, one which is in the title, which is the empirical side of your work. And so looking at the largest piece here, the flat, this, the ceilings, and maybe you want to sort of describe what that work is. And then also the kind of smaller frames to your left, the denim and sand. So there's a, there's a real commitment to taking to the sort of logical ends this idea of like the kind of empirical possibilities of image or photography and that's so that's one side of it and then there's also the way in which flat um i think introduces us to another kind of subtext within the show which is your relationship with painting but maybe we start with the kind of empirical to the nth degree element that's going on in this first space with these works. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, as you're saying, the, the work on the right is about six by eight feet, and that is uh, titled Flat. And it's an, one of the earlier works in the show. I think that I completed this in 1997 or 98. Yeah. And um, it was my apartment at the time, and uh, I had become really interested in in ceiling paintings. Actually, I had had the opportunity to visit uh, Venice, Italy, and um, was really struck by by ceiling paintings, particularly the Renaissance paintings of uh, Tiepolo. Um, I mean, yeah, into Baroque, I guess, and mm -hmm. and how that feeling of looking up in space changed one's experience of that act of looking, and. Um, I made a couple of experiments and then ultimately I had the opportunity to move into this apartment and um, they wouldn't paint it. And so uh, for, for me to move in and I definitely wanted to paint it, but immediately that resistance was an opportunity to really make a work. So I realized that I could make a painting and a painting that could never be seen in one space, but uh, by photographic and digital means, I could fuse these together to make a, a kind of projection looking up of the entire plane of the ceiling. And, um, and so each of the rooms were painted in some kind of association to, I thought, how I might use them. There's like the green of the bathroom is the same as the package of aspirin that I got I, I, in, in Italy or something. Um, but 
it doesn't relate to art history, you know, solely in that way. I mean, I think that when people see this, what they they really often associate it to is the the works of Distill or particularly the uh, Dutch artist Mondrian from the early to mid 20th century. And and that's an artist who is very important to me. And and um, I didn't really know that at the time, but I was excited to see that kind of develop out of it. And uh, I don't know, maybe you should talk a little bit about the sand and the denim on the left. I do. I mean, I think because it's a related sort of, or I think of it as a very related state of mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, everything, each of the photographic works here, the sand, the, the denim on the far left, the sand to its right, and the photograph on the far right that I was just talking about flat are all very highly detailed. And, and I don't know if I make a fetish of that. I, don't, I, don't, I try not to, but it, it gives this opportunity to look directly at something in a very similar fashion to looking at the original object or subject. Um, and so if we look at the denim on the far left there, it's actually made from a very large pair of Levi's 501 pants that were scanned to produce a 20 by 24 image. And it's really in, in, indiscernible from the actual fabric. You can put the yeah. fabric next to it and one would never know. In the same way that the sand, which is uh, titled uh, Sand Point Doom Malibu, California, is is really made from scanning sand, and it's uh, you you can put a, a a pan of sand right next to it, and what one would not be able to tell the difference necessarily unless you lit it in such a way as to have kind of reflection off the grains. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and to me, to do this is to really is to really make it close to the original object as something that I selected and then also as a kind of pictorial space of, of color and uh, then also to tie that into uh, um, a kind of photographic appearance. They appear to be photographs. They appear almost to be a kind of material spread like a painting, like a monochrome on the wall. And then they're also like something I simply selected as as a ready made. It's I, I think that's the mind altering nature of of these works for me is that there's such a considered meeting of all of these points into what I think is like the for you at least with <laughs> these incredibly resolved works. I mean, you know, at, at, you know, at the risk of sounding too modernist, I can't, I can't unpack these to think of another way of formalizing the inquiries that you're making or layering in all of these things. Like there's a sort of, you know, the, the works themselves, the works themselves just prompt can prompt all of those thoughts. But in a way, that's not really the, the point, like you're not kind of dragging us through a, a, a kind of journey or a set of references. It just is like the form is the same as the subject is the same as the context. It's, mm. it's, in, it's remarkably resolved work. And I, I wonder, it's like, for you, what is the um, one of well i i don't wonder i think i observed in the length of time that i was working with you on this show you were you were making new works essentially for this show and so i got a sense that there is i mean there's a, a long process but one that you just you're pretty rigorous and unrelenting in terms of it's not done until it's done that there's still decision making beyond concept or so-called execution that um there's very little of the process that you can delegate for example because there are still things that are coming up in in the stages of rendering and final realization and but i suppose what i don't really know is is whether you feel that as the same you know there's no way around this, even for a work that kind of you describe like denim and sand, and it sounds perfectly seamless and graceful and efficient. But I imagine that actually it, it was a long process to get to that simplicity of form. 
Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that comment and observation. I, um, it's really hard to, to figure out how I make things, but I definitely don't, um, I don't let go, I guess. I'm pretty stubborn and I think it's both a, a beneficial trait and at times I, I'm sure it's also been a limitation for me in one way or another. Um, but, but things kind of must find their form. I don't accept the kind of idea that say just pointing with a camera is an appropriate or that idea of kind of media specificity, like that, that this is the way that a tool is used. Um, and I also don't follow industrial norms. So like, um, I couldn't necessarily tell someone how to make the potato, right? <laughs> I had to scan it and make a 3D model of it and then sort of think about what that was. And, um, the same could go for these. Like, I do know that there was one night where I was like, wow, I could pour sand on a scanner. What would that do? This question of using what it was at the time a pretty new tool was exciting to me. And I wanted to see what it could do, but then I didn't realize what it was for a long time. Mm. I will say one thing is that they're, they, they're specific to scale but then they could expand in all directions. And also it doesn't matter which side goes up or things. A lot of the problems of composition, they, those two works get rid of, right? Like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, the, the people who are framing it, they were like, well, which side up do you want? And I was like, well, it's a landscape. Other than that, I don't care. <laughs> and it, I mean, I've tried other other subjects too. Like one, one thing I would say is that I'm really interested in the denim in the way that it evokes this much larger idea of the United States, right? Like a, yeah. a labor uh, textile. And yet you find out now that most Levi's are not made in the United States. Even, even I believe the sample of what I have would not be now made in the United States. Or if you look at the sand, you're in the same place that I was when I was lying there at the beach trying to look at it and, and sort of thinking about it. But does it relate to the kind of larger idea of what Malibu is as this kind of money luxury location? But... <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's that way for a long time. I thought maybe I should go ahead and jump forward because I think some of the things you were saying about kind of context or thinking about ways to make things might be addressed in another piece. Should I do yes, that? Yes, do it. All right. Um, and actually, I'm thinking of the work on the right here, Archimedean Solid, which relates to the, the potato. Um, and so I'll, I'll go straight to this. This is the pairing of the sculptural version in the California Museum of Photography and then its smaller photographic documentation on the right. We can take a look at that here. Um, that view is from, again, the space uh, that is is next door. And we got we got access to go in and make some kind of careful photographs to to show how the 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 geometric form would extend into that space but just to talk a little bit about the making of this i i mean i i thought maybe i could make it out of aluminum or i contacted a friend of mine who does fabrication and things but nothing seemed right and i couldn't exactly tell them how to make what i didn't even have a full conception of and that's often the case with me is that I'll, I'll more be interested in an idea like the sand in Malibu or yeah. this particular Archimedean solid. But how do I uh, manifest that? How do I produce an image or an object that has the ideas I associate with that? And yeah, in this case, I really had to figure out how to make this form. It's made out of fused plastic and, and cut by a computer. And this is something that I really associate with a kind of history of photography moving into the 20th, 21st century is like, well, if you have a, uh, a 3D model of something, how different is that actually from a negative in the 19th century or uh, a, a projected enlargement from a negative? I actually think it's quite, quite similar. 
Um, mm -hmm. Now I've, you know, made it out of uh, having a computer cut a form instead and re reconstitute that in space. But I think that refers to kind of how you were saying, like, uh, finding the right form for something. Well, I mean, I, I hate the phrase, but I, I've i always, since I first encountered your work, I think of you as somebody, as an early adopter and as somebody who really led the way. And in, and in terms of my own understanding of this space that, you know, I mean, I don't want us to sort of revisit at, with the same age. So it's like we sort of revisit the same past to some degree, but the moment where you're really you you were one of the leading kind of lights for me in terms of understanding that we would get to a place that was as creative within this kind of digital and digital rendering and th 3D printing and all of these things that were sort of opening up within the commercial, so-called commercial world of advertising and image making, but were yet to be really proven as anything more than kind of faster simulations of analog processes. And, you know, it, we were on that cusp of understanding where artists and where creative practice could be found within digital processes, which, which, as I say, were kind of more like industry kind of led than creative independent practice led. And so I think of you as somebody who just just on, on a conceptual level, on a kind of thought level, was really there ahead you know front running in terms of thinking about what digital would mean for this idea of photography mm -hmm. i mean i uh you know i appreciate that that's a uh, contextualizing the way that i make things in in a fashion that i'm definitely not shy of in fact i'm yeah. i'm quite flattered by and um you know i i have students who are who are sort of adopting different things at this point. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate that. I also would say that, you know, you asked about like what observations have I had about my work having put up this show with you of 20 to 25 years of uh, production. And, and I would say that I'm, I'm very pleased in a, in, to find out that it's not it's not tied to 1995 or it's not tied to 2003 or it's not even tied to uh, five or 10 years ago, even at times where I can be very specific about, hey, this is what you can do. This is defined by the medium at that one moment. Yeah. And um, it seems to, to hang together based upon the kind of subjects that were chosen. And I think that that's a really important thing. Like if we think about this, we can certainly think about how, uh, say, Hollywood or um, photographic technology has has long appreciated putting something virtual into a space. But often it's about exploiting that moment's uh, specific technological advance. And so what you end up seeing, right, is the technology. You don't see yeah. the kind of association to the world or one's experience, one's feeling of, of gravity or the kind of particularities of the space that something is in. Um, like the, well, the yeah, potato. I mean, D d Go like, ahead. you know, I'd never feel that technology is the subject in, in your work. I mean, it might be the root because, but it's within this kind of constellation of everything being at play, painting, sculpture, architecture, and as it happens, kind of digital imaging processes. So there's a sort of, that that's the relief for me is, 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 is that I wasn't put in a position where I had to sort of contextualize each technological decision that you have made over the course of your practice, because that's not, that's not the central tenet of, of why those, why you chose those processes and those forms. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so maybe uh, we can look at look forward a little bit. Um, yeah. If I can just pause for a second, because I know that we're taking more time than I thought. But I'm, you know, I love the conversation with you, Charlotte. So um, 
I don't know if they... We can't help ourselves. I mean, I don't think we'll ever be a 30-minute conversation (laughs) (laughs) ever again. I I mean, you know, I'm trying. I don't... (laughs) Um, So so we'll keep going forward and and skipping a few things. I just don't want to... I don't want to insult you by jumping ahead in a place that you have something to say, because I think what you're saying is important. So, yeah. No, no. I think think now we're going to walk through the show and we're going to find those other elements that we'd really like the listener to this conversation to bear in mind when they're walking around the exhibition. Like, just fill in the blanks of what the various empirical experiences are of this exhibition. Yeah. All right. So um, uh, getting back to things, I'm going to, oh, I yeah, I did want to say uh, in, in some ways, if we were talking about this work in uh, relation to the subject, it does have a kind of oppositional nature to the potato. And I think of that as kind of the body. And then this is a sort of mind alternate to it. But then I find that they also shift back and forth that in some ways, this is more of the bodily one. And then the kind of like the warty covered uh, potato ends up being a little bit closer maybe to the the mind version. And I, I don't know what to say about that. But maybe it underscores what you're saying about being tied to subject more than technology in the approach. And I think it's, but I also think it's to do with the fact that because you create such resolved works of art, that it is also, and and that the work is as much about image as it is about the sculptural or, or the painterly. Um, so there's a lot for the body and for us as to viscerally experience within an exhibition like this that that things like the archimedean solid which is is you know this kind of pseudochrome uh, shape um they're sort of like characters as well and it's like so sometimes you know and the potato as well like sometimes the potato is you know you know it's got a certain characterization, but you can switch it just as much as you can switch a perception of a character or as a or a kind of another body, right? And it's the same with the Archimedean solid, and that happens consistently through the exhibition. That depending on which vantage point or which kind of context that you see the work, it becomes something else. And that was very much something that we built into the design of the exhibition. Like um, rather than having kind of these kind of like L shapes or kind of zigzag walls, which means that you rather than them being these kind of barriers or these kind of kind of clear architectural demarcations of room one room two room three these partitions become like different ways different vistas and different constellations of objects so something like the archimedean solid it feels different when you come you come at it you know with the with the stellar column with flat like this kind of faceting this very painterly faceting it's less sculptural faceting it's more painterly faceting so you read it as one thing but then when you're coming at it and you know from the other angle you know with the LACMA piece, it becomes something else. So the characters that that these, particularly the sculpture works are performing within the space changes depending on which context you see them in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. And I appreciate the way that you made rooms and yet the rooms are very open and they are sort of just enclosures for reviewing the works in in a different context and uh, from a different sight line, a different vista. Um, in the show, like here, you can see the LACMA piece and then in the distance is, a, uh, is the potato. And then on the left there, we're not really gonna talk about it, but it's another kind of version of that geometric, that Archimedean solid used in a quite different kind of fashion. And um, yeah. I think it bears out what you're saying. As you enter into this space, you get to another work. We were talking about the kind of time specificity of uh, 
the digital tools. And um, I really appreciate you sort of putting me in the, the position of someone who developed these and, uh, and, and gave them kind of a, a form that, uh, yeah, outside of just the industrial need, I guess, the industrial expectation. This is a rendering of the Miracle Mile, the Wilshire Boulevard between Fairfax and La Brea in Los Angeles. And at different times, I kind of lived at both sides of, of the Miracle Mile here, off it a ways. But, um, but I walked it and I was really aware of the kind of beauty of these signs that are perpendicular to the flow of traffic. You could see places where the cars would be going down the street around the central sign that says Miracle Mile in, this, in the center. And, yeah. and yet I felt like um, looking at this, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not miraculous, right? It doesn't have anything to do with miracles in a kind of Christian sense. Um, and then there are other places where the kind of crass commercialism really comes to the fore, like at the top in the center, there's a People's Bank sign and entertainment television. And this kind of um, ambivalence between things that I find very seductive about a kind of spectacle of sale uh, are mitigated by also some hesitation. The, uh, on one side of the street, you see there's Office Depot, and on the other side of the street, you see Staples Office Supply or Save on Drugs versus Rite Aid and these things where there's uh, supposed um, options that are presented to us. Actually, when space is compressed in, in a work like this, what you do, do see is a kind of comparison of those options that makes them not to be very different from one another. Yeah. And, uh, so. And also the obsolescence, like I'm just like, because it's quite large, the blockbuster in the right hand work. And so you begin, and so the sort of obsolescence of a lot of these kind of, you know, destinations on the Miracle Mile become... It yeah. And it's alternate Hollywood video, both of which are defunct at this point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think maybe that kind of comparison of, uh, of choice, of, of the illusion of choice is presented in some ways in these two works. On the left is a uh, selected product from 2001 and on the right is rejected product from 2002. And uh, Again, sort of like the sand, which was made around the same time, I realized that I could scan all sides of a, an ordinary product from my cabinet in my kitchen, my pantry. And then I could make a kind of illusion of the, the totality of the design that advertises something like, I don't know, uh, crackers or Rice Krispies or chamomile tea. And then having made that work selected products on the left a year later i realized that every single product had some kind of competing alternate that i didn't choose that at the supermarket i didn't go and pick but yeah. pretty much their equivalents and i thought well why not kind of bear out the serial nature of photography or for that matter sculpture and sort of make these virtual views of of both the selected and the rejected taste objects, I guess. And it's sort of for, in the exhibition, it's sort of part of a kind of a constellation that we kept physically quite close together in the end, uh, with um, other works like this Photoshop, Photoshop, which for me is like you know the altarpiece of this idea of these kind of empty packages, these empty vessels. And obviously with Photoshop, um, correct me if I'm wrong, these are kind of early examples of the packaging for Photoshop when you acquired, which is obviously deeply ironic and deeply symbolic um, that, that essentially a digital uh, a di digital product which has is totally disembodied would have this kind of massive packaging and this kind of graphic identity uh, which at the time in the early days was seen as like massively important to knowing that you had literally bought something you know because 
I think that's, you know, particularly within kind of highly developed commercial cultures like America, it's really difficult. It's like, what am I getting for my money? So these packages had deep resonance at the beginning, ironically, of Photoshop. Yeah, I I, I think you put your finger on it. So, yeah, these are, I think it's maybe 10 to 15 years ago. Um, and it's when they sort of phase into having, uh, yeah, only an online, only a downloadable, only something one rents forever but never owns, where the product becomes truly virtual. And this is when they still would sell a disc and you put the disc and the intellectual property would, would become, you know, you know, it would it would be copied onto your computer so that you could use it as a tool that still had a relationship to materiality. And, you know, there's kind of hokey, uh, like an eye looking through a magnifying glass or an overlapping image of masked uh, feathers or things. It's it's a, uh, they do display characteristics of the product, but it, as you say, it's right at this moment where no longer does the product have any material uh, qualities at all. It becomes a, a kind of uh, example of pure intellectual property. And yet, of course, I, I use this tool. I you know, like you, yeah. you, 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 you accused me of being an early adopter, and and I admit that. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's a. Uh, I'll take that on. I mean, I started using it in uh, in art school in 1994, and it never it never seemed odd to me. I mean, I you know like uh, yeah, it never seemed odd to me. It was a, a a tool that I could question from the get go, and um, I think uh, yeah, I've continued to question it. Um, and th this manner of working, I realized actually, I've made a bunch of different sorts of. Uh, uh, versions of this. I've made things that were uh, household products and then had gone so far as the, the work that we were just looking at showing an institutional uh, kind of uh, a commercial product, uh, an, an imaging product. Um, in this case, on the left is uh, the Rice Krispies box from 2001 when I scanned it and I would make these kind of isometric uh, uh, projections of the boxes to keep the scans and be able to kind of work with them. And then I realized that those could be works in their own right. Yeah. And um, then I returned to it in uh, 2012, I think it's 11 or 12 years later. And um, these characters, this design had changed significantly. On the left, uh, what is it? Snap, crap, crackle, pop are these kind of uh, cute kid-like uh, cartoon characters and then on the right they're a little bit uneasy they make me a little they're a little creepy uh these kind of 3d modeled uh little i don't know not human characters that that kind of i don't know they're they're, they're not comforting to me at all but but again <laughs> you see this as like having nutrition facts having all of this incredible kind of advertising from Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse on top of it to you you just realize right like this is a cereal it, it, it's a cereal it's a puffed piece of rice I or <laughs> yeah, it's kind of entirely absurd and yet we're we're kind of caught in the phantasm of of being advertised to which which is gratifying right I, I appreciate that entertainment aspect but it's a good thing to point to at times I think yeah, absolutely. And I, I think your active choices are pretty rudimentary or kind of deeply dematerialized products. Um, um, and this focus on their packaging is is highly resonant because of that, because because you're talking about something that essentially is not unique in any way. It's 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 narrative that it kind of creates that sort of heritage and that unique set of qualities. Yeah. Now, Brandon, we have been talking for quite a while, and I am yeah. conscious that yeah. we um, we need to conclude. I mean, in the sense that there are many amazing works in this show, and I wonder if we could pick a sort of final piece just to talk about. Um, I mean, I would love it to be this piece because the the the, the sculpture, the the mirrored sculpture, just because. Uh, I think, you know, I watched you working with 
UCR's installation team to actually bring this work into this kind of land of being site specific and this character emerges, this kind of beautiful disco beauty kind of emerges in the exhibition and it's a real treat and you know the exhibition itself is full of these extremely delightful visceral experiences but I wonder if one place to conclude just to take us to completely to an unexpected space is exactly where you're taking us now which is up to the mezzanine of CNP to this piece which is a reinstallation right a rethink yes yeah, um, thanks for sort of pulling us towards probably the one of the centerpieces of the show and yeah. and certainly uh, something that I think uh, I'm really known for. There's a, a range of works that have been um, collected by different museums. Um, and then there are things that are much more rare and uh, must be installed in a very specific way. And the work on the left is titled Reciprocity of Light. And, um, and uh, I'll, I'll switch into that in a second. Yeah. Um, I wanted to give it a little bit of context by um, Reciprocity of Light was, uh, was first shown in 2010, I believe, and it's in the room on the left. But I wanted to give it some context with this work that is on the right, which is the, the, the earliest work that I still sort of attribute um, to, to my, my body of work. Um, this is Beacon from 1995, and that's me uh, uh, holding a kind of uh, an antiquated lantern um, signaling to uh, 1995 Los Angeles in the distance there. And this is related specifically to uh, a, a work of Caspar David Friedrichs, and it, um, he's a, an artist really associated with the sublime. But for me, what was really interesting as a, 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 a recent transplant to Los Angeles was to really think about this sort of city of lights, right? Like um, yeah. me as an individual holding an old fashioned lantern with a, a, a large format uh, a sheet film camera recording a black and white image connecting to this sort of uh, vista in the distance of all of these lights and um, sort of this compression of time in space. And then in 2010, I went on and I, I made this work, which has a central light that you can you can see here on, on the left hand side, hanging in the middle of the space. And then it has an array of uh, light sensitive uh, kind of cells that then illuminate when one's shadow falls upon the wall, one's shadow from the central light. You can see that here. in this um you know it's it's just an iphone video uh that was sent to me of uh someone moving their hand as a shadow in front of the wall but that shadow then becomes con converted in a kind of uh a, a, a somewhat yeah confounding way into light i mean we have forever associated the idea of a shadow as a denial of light and yet this this project that i worked on for three or four years ends up making a kind of architectural space where one can experience their shadow as instead a kind of energizing as opposed to a a, a denial of that kind of energy of light it's absolutely mesmerizing i mean both even in a iphone documentation but um especially when you're physically interacting you are the you are the instigator of this reciprocity of light and your head really you can't you can barely get your head around it but what happens is you're trying to flip your understanding of like this you know this obliteration of shadow and instead it's it's replacement by these kind of orbs of light and these kind of orbs of energy as you're trying to sort of get your head around that it is as if um i mean for me anyway i had a really strong emotional response to it and i don't know whether it is about you know coming coming through to this phase of a pandemic 
but I felt absolute wonder in a way that um, I didn't feel like I had felt for an incredibly long time. It's a really astounding police. And I love the way that, I mean, most likely, most visitors to the exhibition will um, experience the ground floor, which is this interconnected threads of work produced over the 25 years. And then you come up to, to the mezzanine and to reciprocity of light. And so there's a chance that, that really you don't come to have this moment a full kind of impact of how sensory and how visceral your work is until you hit this, this spot. And I don't know, it's a real gift. I think it's, and it makes, for me, it makes the show feel very timely to the context in which we are, we are now reviewing and coming back into spaces to think about art. So. Um, I'm really glad that this piece has been remade for your exhibition. Excellent. I, I don't know what I can add to that. I mean, I certainly appreciate the uh, way you invoke wonder and, and I think fascination. And yeah. those are things that are not, um, they're not dirty words to me, right? Like I, I'm, I'm very interested <laughs> in the way that one can be, like in this project, one is aware of your own body. And one's aware of your own body doing pretty ordinary things. You know, at times people do do more performative things, but they become a kind of subject, but not in a so self-conscious way. And mm -hmm. um, they're able to look at this phenomena and maybe step outside of their own body in a sense and kind of look at that phenomena in, in a way that I think does invoke wonder and fascination. And... Um, as long as they have that ability to look and, and scrutinize, then, then it's still something that is of value to me, you know? Brandon, it's an honor to know you and it has been an utter pleasure to work with you on this exhibition. Many congratulations. And I really look forward to regrouping with you and planning our events in January to reflect on the full run of this incredible show. Thanks so much. Excellent. Thank you. Let's uh, let's get together and uh, and and bring some people in and and talk about the work more. It's been a real pleasure, and I, I've loved uh, the conversation we've had all along and as well as today. Cool. How are you? That was fun. It was it was it was okay. I don't usually like seeing myself speaking. <laughs> I that that doesn't usually make me happy, but I, I really appreciate it. And um, I thought that uh, Charlotte was so generous. I, well, yeah, I hadn't seen it since, but I thought she was really uh, sensitive to the work, so. Absolutely, very perceptive. I, I guess that's what happens if you do 25, 20, 25 years of wonderful work and attract attention from very good curators, then they go, oh, okay, I love this work. I understand this work. This work has influenced me. So that's that's really great. We have some questions. I don't know if you see in the Q&A, there's, I guess I'll just pick the one to start with. The works that utilize mass produced products are clearly in dialogue with Warhol. Can you say more about that relationship? Oh, that, that, that's interesting. Um, there's no doubt that uh, the works that I have made that, uh, um, that deal with like product packaging, uh, they address not just the um, the Brillo boxes of Warhol, but also the Campbell soup cans and things like that. Um, uh, Warhol is a bit of a, a, a an issue for me. I come back to and I'm constantly fascinated by and then I'm also uh, I'm I'm also consistently troubled by. And so I guess those are characteristics of, of describing uh, uh, a significant and kind of long term relationship with. Um, I wouldn't take the question to mean that I was, uh, you know, uh, rehearsing the same sort of gestures, um, but it might be worth saying that I think that um, my works really do demonstrate a kind of uh, phantasm or something that is about an image in a, a really extremely kind of dematerialized sense 
in a way that uh, as much as I love like the stack of Brillo boxes that I, I've seen throughout my career and I last saw, I think in 2017 at the Whitney, um, th th they're important to me, but I, I feel like I'm doing something a bit different too. I think you're doing something a lot different just to throw it in. I mean, Warhol looked at like Coca-Cola as democratic, like the queen can't get a better Coca-Cola than anyone else, which was one of his comments. And yours, yours in picking like puffed rice, as you say, and saying, look at all the packaging and mystique that, that gets attached to this in order to market it, that, that's, a, that's not um, a celebration of democracy. That's a critique of, among other things, it's a critique of this whole system. You know, that's quite different than Warhol, I think. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I wonder whether it like no one ever Warhol is very cagey, right? I'm not, not exactly sure how he stood. And um, well, one thing I would say that I share is a great, a, de a, a great ambivalence, like I'm really unsure of how I relate to that. You know, I'm just gonna say in a, in a, in a, in an aside, I, I'm, I'm always fixated on the story of when Yeltsin went to uh, Houston to visit the, I think it was the moonshot, like uh, the space programmer things. And he, he directed his drivers to take him to a supermarket in, uh, outside of Houston. And, and I understand that it was a, really an effect on him to see the proliferation and the amount of choice that was available in the supermarket. I don't know what to say about that, but I am adding that. You know, I did open up the, the thing and I see that um, uh, uh, Amir, an, an old friend of mine, uh, said, can Brandon talk about the abstract pieces with text on the mezzanine level of the show? And uh, Doug, I'm going to ask you actually maybe to sort of like feed me questions afterwards, but I did see that he asked that. Yeah, yeah, go for it. I wanted to address that. Um, there are six pieces that are facing alternate directions on the mezzanine overlooking the rest of the works. And they're kind of small. In fact, they are they are about 20 by 24. And um, they show subtitles from films that I've watched since the beginning of the pandemic with my family. And, and they show those subtitles on a field of a kind of repeating pattern. And um, what the pattern is, is actually a selection of uh, a single figure, usually the figure that's speaking, um, and then that spread across the surface of the image. And so one's left with language that is translated from uh, another, another uh, non-English language originally, and then this kind of English subtitle hovering in space, and I guess hovering in some kind of context. I don't know if, uh, yeah, I guess there are no verbal questions. We only have, uh, we have questions that are by text. Yeah, I, I, I like the uh, a question here that basically involves how moving to Los Angeles, which you reference in your talk, influenced you. And that, you know, Charlotte mentions that characters come through in the exhibition and that LA is a character in your show, the LACMA piece, the Miracle Mile piece. And, and so, this person who is anonymous says, I see references to Ed Ruscha, other Southern California artists that were entrenched in the canon of LA art by the time. So how did, how did moving to Los Angeles perhaps influence your practice is the core of this question. Yeah, um, thank you for sort of giving that, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, what do I say? It's, it's funny, after the reception, I had a conversation with uh, Simon Leung for a little while and he uh, he said I didn't realize how much your of your work uh, dealt with Los Angeles, and I didn't either. I have to say I wonder if I lived in in Berlin or if I lived in I don't know um, another city whether it would be simply the the relationship to other cities. I, I should say that there's no doubt that the history of Los Angeles uh, art. Um, in the, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and, and, and to the contemporary moment has been really influential. And also I feel as though I've been a participant in that back and forth. Um, there's a lot of works that I've made that relate particularly to various figures. I mean, Ed Ruscha certainly made uh, every building on the Sunset Strip, and I was not, I was, I was responding to that in some sense with the Miracle Mile. I mean, it's a, another section of urban space 
that I tried to address in a, I think a very different way, but, uh, but in a related way for sure. So I don't know if that answers that, but yeah. I, I think you're doing a good job. I'm sort of summarizing these long ones. So th there's a question uh, about the role of human presence and representation in your work with the comment that a lot of the work are devoid of human representation, but that there's a constant feeling of human presence and bodily engagement that you've talked about throughout. So people might face away or there's you facing away and you're slightly uncomfortable or eerie ways. Um, so what about human presence and representation in, in the work? <laughs> I, lo I love the, the, the question and I'm going to try to, yeah, but then what you just said is what about human presence and the, the body or like, like that, that, that's, that's it, right? Like, I mean, I think that there's so much that could be said in response to that. And um, the, I mean, I, I guess one thing that I would say is that I am interested in um, the way that, that artworks uh yeah it's, it's almost a, a dumb thing to say uh that artworks have a direct relationship both uh mentally and physically for people especially sculpture and i think my work even though the exhibition is in the california museum of photography my work has gone in a more kind of uh sculptural and experiential direction perhaps with slideshows or video pieces uh of late but um yeah there's certainly photographic works um to think about that uh is to invoke various uh legacies of a uh, kind of like what's described as the mind body problem and i mean i think that we're always unable to imagine ourselves in any other form other than the one that is constrained us from birth and that's the form that also it does guide and govern our uh, uh, experience, our empirical understanding of the world. And um, so, so where does that leave us? It, where does it leave me as someone who makes things that are born of my own experience, but then want to give that experience in some sense to uh, a, yeah, a wider public? I don't know if I'm, I, that's not a good answer. I think that, yeah, maybe we can come back around and uh, someone can, <laughs> can push find. me further there. Meanwhile, there's there's a follow-up question from Amir who asked the earlier one related to Warhol and pop culture. And he says, the question was more about what it may, means to make a very unique high art work out of something mass produced and marketed for kids, Rice Krispies. I um, mean, you could make a translucent, box object isometric out of anything, but what is the specificity, this is quoting him, of using a mass produced cheap food box for the work? That's, this is a, a follow on to the previous question. I love these questions, they're really great. Yeah, um, I, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I've made so many product pieces, like I'll, I'll just scan one and I'll make it. Um, and, uh, they, they, they are, it's like photographing an object. And in that sense, actually, um, to come back to, I think, uh, Amir's earlier question, they relate to Warhol that way. Like Warhol would select subjects, he would select celebrities, he would select uh, products and things like that. Um, I could go ahead and say that, like, particularly with the Rice Krispies, I was interested in returning to that. It was the largest single product in the first iteration of that manner of working but i'm also like um i think that yeah in a personal sense my personal experience i remember being a kid and looking at like granola packages when i was five <laughs> or sitting and eating breakfast it's funny the places where you sit and think and contemplate i've often thought about the way that i look at the ceiling and contemplate or or something like that when i'm lying in bed um, but I remember having, uh, I don't know, maybe some excessively sugary cereal or something like that, too. And, and having that kind of sense when I was very young about cereal packages and that it was like the, the highest profile, biggest impact kind of um, visual space when maybe I was six to ten or something. So I think that's where Rice Krispies comes back around. I don't know if that answers that question, but... 
yeah. Well, it's Try. not. Well, Amir will jump back on with a follow up to the follow up. So. Yeah. Another another question, which I'll try and summarize, relates to the Casper David Friedrich. Uh, the photo you said uh, had allusions to the to the famous Casper David Friedrich painting that engages with the sublime. Where else in your work do we find an allusion to the sublime with a follow on that says one way, the only way to think about the sublime is that it cannot be represented. It can only be experienced bodily. So the Friedrich that your lamp uh, photo riffs off of is not a representation of the sublime, according to this writer. It's a picture of someone having an experience of the sublime. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I, I, wanna, I wanna say that this is a question uh, by Morgan Fisher and uh, someone that I've had a, a long dialogue with as well. I appreciate the questions from people that I, I've known for quite a while. Um, so, uh, I think that's true. I think that like in, in some fashion, the sublime needs to be mediated by another body. Um, and how does that, uh, exist throughout the, um, the, the show or other works of mine? I think it's, I think it is actually a really significant and important problem. Um, there's a there's a number of ways of taking that. I mean, I'm going to say one thing, and that's that by linking the Peace Beacon from 1995, the picture of me holding the lantern above the lights of Los Angeles, I linked that piece with reciprocity of light and reciprocity of light as a space. Um, it encourages one uh, to walk into the space and interrupt the the passage of light from the the central light bulb and onto the wall where it's sensitized where it's a, a kind of imitation of a, uh, a a camera sensor or a piece of film in some way and then it reverses it and produces light in that case it's funny i mean i wanted that to be something that i thought um people wanted to interact with and i think that in an initial sense they do Right, they 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 think that there's uh, some phenomena, even some yeah yeah some kind of spectacle that's going on, but it it is also one that is not um, necessarily fulfilling. Like it doesn't necessarily ask you to perform, and this is a long way of uh, trying to answer the mediation of the sublime, in that and that's a kind of technological sublime which is worthy of some scrutiny as well, what constitutes technological sublime. But the thing about this is that actually people are far more comfortable in the reciprocity of light work by watching others. And it invokes this kind of like, uh, um, yeah, it, it does, in, in to use a, a term that is certainly degraded at this point, it, it makes an object of the body of the viewer. And that's not always a comforting kind of thing. Um, I think it's a feeling that actually perhaps approaches the jeopardy that the sublime in a 18th century kind of fashion invokes, that one feels the pressure in the Caspar David Friedrich of the vastness of the world or the overwhelmingness of the natural phenomena, things like weather and things. I think in some way, the discomfort that one might feel by being put uh, on display and having their shadow enact a kind of uh, um, spectacle on the wall, it kind of catches them in this um, space, in some ways of ambivalence that runs throughout my work in its relationship to really capitalism. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to shy away from that. I, uh, I find actually more and more that one of my roles as a professor is to ask students to kind of think about other, other options in the world and, and, and to expand a little bit upon that since so much of my work does deal with aspects of, of uh, commerce and capital is to really think about like what one's position is and, and whether other options are, are viable at this moment. So maybe that's a reaching answer. I hope that <laughs> people will people will take me to task later. Um, I, I have a follow up question. I, I mean, Charlotte made the comment about reciprocity of light that she was really 
you know, fascinated and mesmerized by it. And I find myself I've been in it a whole lot of times now. I'm lucky enough to work in the museum. And so I saw it being installed and, and while it was underway, and then I can go in just by myself and, and play with it. And it is, you know, it, it does activate you. I, I know people want to watch someone else doing it, but I definitely want to play with it. Uh -huh. And I, I quickly arrived at, you know, the inversion you talk about. Okay, that's not a shadow anymore. That's actually... That's that's a you know a, an amazing array of sort of pixel-like objects that that activate instantaneously on that wall in response to me waving my hand or walking in front and so on. And then as a photo curator and photographer myself, I kind of went, but you can't freeze it. You can't capture it. It's only while you're there and active. So it is, it's like a sensor, but it's like a sensor that doesn't actually take seize that moment you know which is kind of fantastic too it's ephemeral and it it vanishes in the same way that a photo is only going to last you know i have a geologist for a father so the photo is only going to last like that long it doesn't you know it can be a couple hundred years but that's not much i don't know so i love the uh, the ephemeral quality of it um i don't know that yeah that's just a comment really i i appreciate that i mean i think that one of the things about that project is that it is like it's it, it's totally in a in a latent state when you walk in there are many people who've seen that work and it's been exhibited five times in europe and the united states there are many people who've seen that work and just walk in and see a light bulb and they think that's the deal and 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 that in its own way is kind of fine it's funny because i stay in the conversation with charlotte that I'm pleased that my work is not governed by the the kind of time frame of the industrial uh, uh, device that I'm I'm using at the time. But the one that really does do that is the incandescent light bulb that is in reciprocity of light that causes the the source, because it's a a, a pinpoint of light. In fact, it's a little bit harder to do that with something that's not a specialty device with LEDs or something. But uh, Doug, I mean, I think that. Um, your question hinges upon the fascinating. And uh, I said at the end, and you brought that up with Charlotte, that I am interested in fascination. I, I'm also interested in wonder. I had a I had a class with my graduate students last spring, and we we had a conversation uh, topic of of like what's the cost of wonder. And that sounds like a really easy question to answer. In fact, I think that's a really troubling and and complicated, maybe not troubling, but a complicated question to ask. What what, what does it take to sort of like, yeah, to have the time and the and the the presence to wonder? But my work is very much about indications of the autonomy of an individual to be in that state. And, and I really do divide that state from the one of stupefaction. Um, there's many people who have uh, described the kind of trance that are that one watching a narrative cinema, a film go into. And that's a that's a, a very important state to me to kind of think about. But it's it's not one that I want. I, I really always want a completely uh, present and kind of aware viewer. And I think that that state of both wonder and fascination necessitates that. People are aware of their own body. And that's not always, like I said before, maybe I overstated, it's not always something that makes them uh, pleased, but. That's marvelous. I'll just add one comment and we'll get to some more questions that flood in here. Eventually we'll have to cut this off. But um, Isaac Newton, there's a famous comment of Newton's that his his whole quest all of newton attributed everything he did to a sense of wonder he said i've been like a person walking down a beach and stopping every so often and picking up a beautiful pebble yeah which i'm like the guy that's just that's amazing right i mean that's openness to wonder leads to isaac yeah. newton yeah it, it's interesting that you say that because of course um isaac newton and his relationship to both the physics of gravity and light is central to the enlightenment central to these kinds of uh questions that i think are are really viably being re-questioned right now and um yeah i like uh another another aspect i mean like i think about gravity a lot in relationship to sculpture sculpture is in many ways the the effort of simply getting getting stuff off the floor and um 
I was really struck by like like gravity is a is a universal fact there's there's like no doubt about that but when you consider it from the vantage point of an artist actually that universality is neutralized almost immediately and i i i'm really very aware of like the difference of gravity between like a, a two-year-old uh, and a 15-year-old and uh someone who's <laughs> my age or or someone who's who's elderly gravity really affects us all in very different ways if i'm going to be uh someone making sculpture and i'm going to invoke gravity i'm really going to try to be um sensitive to and, and really thinking about how that shifts from person to person even while in the terms of physics it's a it's a universal it's a universal so we, I think you can see in the Q&A, we have a, a follow-up question from Morgan Fisher, your friend. I suddenly understand your interest in Roysdale, the skies, the clouds, the ma majesty of untrammeled nature as being related to your interest in the sublime. Comment? Question mark? Um, uh, yeah, R Rusdale has mm -hmm. uh, long been a figure of interest to me. Jakob van Rusdale, the Dutch uh, landscape yeah. uh, artist. And... Um, uh, Morgan knows that. Also, another figure, um, I'm really interested in the paintings of George Innes, uh, American uh, uh, landscape uh, painter. And um, maybe one thing to say in response to what Morgan's bringing up is the, yeah, one, yeah, one's engagement and complicity, but also uh, some of these figures really strived to make the figure that is in their paintings into a kind of conduit for the potential for belief or the failure to achieve belief. And I mean, in, in a kind of spiritual sense. And um, it, I, yeah, I, I, I'm not a, a figure with a kind of uh, spirituality, but I, I certainly respect that. And I do think that there's this kind of continuity that uh, is, is tied to that. And yeah, I would also say that there's the other aspect to that is that um, my prior description about uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, being caught within the kind of commercial thing is that there's always the subtext with capital that it's a kind of fatalist, um, a fait accompli, like that there's there's no doubt that this is the way of the world. And, and yeah, being bought, caught between those characteristics of the desire for some uh, potential, yeah, spirituality and uh, the loss of uh, an individual within a system of capital is, is very troubling. I guess we, we, we've had a, quite a flood of questions. There's, there's a few more, but I think we have, we should wrap it up here. We're about at time. So there's one from Rita Souther, who is our exhibitions manager at the museum. What are you interested in now? What do you look forward to exploring in future works? I mean, I'd love to answer that question, but I'm going to go ahead and do that in a second. But I see Natalie's question. Oh, all right. Can you talk about the relationship of surface between the packages, like the Rice Krispies, or the It's It's box, and the way that you rendered your full typography, thinking about the thighs piece and how the words become a form and surface. Surface and the idea of taste seem to be so connected. Sorry to take over. I do appreciate no, 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 no. reading the questions, but um, Natalie, Natalie's actually one of the people that I've talked a lot about the issues of gravity and sculpture with, and we've gone back and forth about that. Um, and what, what can I say uh, about um, these things? I mean, for one thing that they are always projections and they're projections in a kind of geometric sense, but then they're projections in the sense of like trying to achieve some even failed model of the real. Wow, I'm surprised I'm saying that. I don't think that I would. <laughs> Natalie would give me a hard time later. But um, <laughs> that they are in some way, like in terms of the piece that is titled Thighs, which is a white sculpture of the word thighs, but it's, it's, uh, it's projected prismatically from that, the letter form. Um, I'm thinking of pushing the letter form to the point at which one can no longer reconcile the mental model, the linguistic model, and has to instead be uh, left with 
the very real, but the the um, the very present instead, for a better word, uh, uh, physicality of the kind of sculpture on the wall. And that's, I think, in a way similar to my consistent use of type. I'm, I'm always using this typeface that I designed uh, Prism Gothic that can, instead of be sort of heavier or lighter weight, it, exp it, it expresses itself, it, it projects into space in kind of three dimensions. And that's a cliche. I mean, I was at the, uh, uh, my, one of my son's soccer games the other night and along the wall, I think it said tigers or something like that in these projected spray painted letters. And I, and I loved it. And the reason why that it's there is it's this kind of boosterism. It's this thing that becomes more real than just the, the language itself. And yet it also shows that it doesn't, it doesn't rely upon that boosterism as a kind of facet into itself. Um, so you asked about Rita's question, what's next? Yeah. Always hard. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm glad that Amir asked about the, um, the subtitle, the projection translations that are on the mezzanine. Those I've finished in the last six months, uh, eight months now. It, they were from beginning of January of this year. Um, I'm always working on a lot of things simultaneously. I got to say, I'd love to sculpt a mango, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Hey, hey, that potato is beautiful. I think you can handle a mango. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. It's a, yeah, there's a different sort of a challenge. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it's a funny thing because I also feel like a fair amount of my work does address uh, 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 obsolescence and I am not in a, even though this is a, this is some kind of a survey show looking back over 25 years, I'm certainly not looking back. Um, language, I could see you do, doing a show fully of all pieces related to language from the subtitled works that are titled the collectively projection translations to more pieces like thighs and other works that, um, that mess with actual letters along the wall but but yeah we will see that seems to go down an ed ruche sort of track in your own yeah, yeah. way yeah i i hear that and and yet uh the the subtitled pieces don't really read that way I no they don't at all them. they don't at all i love them I, I think they're wonderful actually all right this is this has been so fun really fun i mean it, it's totally great um Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Brandon. The, the exhibition is up through February 8th. Am I, do I have that right? Um, yep, that's right. Or, or February 6th. Anyway, February 6th. a long time. Yeah, so come on down and uh, uh, play with the sublime and so forth. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an hour outside of Los Angeles on a, on a good day. And uh, yeah, please uh, go see the show. I hope you have a chance to. All right, thank you so much. All right, thank you all. Bye.